In this episode, we'll be investigating the sources of our drinking water pollution in Ireland. We'll be exploring the spectacular geoparks in our ancient Copper Coast. But first, to the Burren for a look at a project that reveals what's happening to its biodiversity. Considering how important biodiversity is to our continued well-being on this planet, we know very little about it. A recent European Commission report found that less than a quarter of us Irish know what biodiversity means. Put simply, this is the variety of life on Earth, such as diversity between and within species, interacting with their ecosystems and habitats. Through the changes in our agriculture over the past 40 years, we've taken our biodiversity for granted ignoring the needs of plants, animals and insects all around us. The rapid development in roads and houses countrywide impacts on biodiversity. All that could be set to change. I talked to Taigo Mahoney of the EPA about these threats. Ireland's biodiversity is under constant threat, be it from land use change, environmental pollution, but also a lack of information and a lack of understanding. And in order to fill these gaps, the EPA promotes research in biodiversity. BioChange, which is based in the Burren and County Clare, involving researchers from NUI Galway, UCC and Trinity College Dublin, looks at the impact of land use change on the sensitive habitats, species and indeed landscapes in the Burren and County Clare. I travelled to County Clare to meet Maria Long of the BioChange project. She's looking at the effects of grazing on the Burren one of our most fragile landscapes and habitats. Yeah, the burn is a very special area. I suppose the most dramatic and obvious thing, uh, you can see it here behind us, is the bare limestone rock that outcrops everywhere. It makes it a very unusual habitat. The plants uh, that live here, some, some of them are very unusual in the, in the combinations in which they grow. This area is certainly unique to Ireland and there are similar areas in other parts of Europe and in other parts of the world but few have the same plant combination so it's quite a unique area. And why has it happened that way that this particular area has developed? I know there's limestone here, limestone pavement, but what has made it so special? Well that's a million dollar question Duncan. There are many theories uh, and many conflicting theories for some of the different plants and animals. There may be issues of glacial refugia, there may be certain conditions um, because of Ireland's extremely moist climate, also because of the exposure and, the, and the, the, the tough life for plants on these rocks. There are different combinations that maybe you just don't find in other places. Core samples show that this karst landscape was actually forested with pine and hazel on very thin soil up to the Bronze Age. Maybe in the early Bronze Age, a lot of that was cut, either for farming or for fuel, and that there was a sudden loss of soil. It was both blown away by the wind and washed down the rocks. So a lot of this habitat, and the, the, the habitat that, that allows the special plants and animals to live here, was in fact created by man. One of the main things a biochange hopes to do is collect baseline information. It's what called baseline. It's when there's no previous uh, comprehensive study done and to feed that in to policy makers, decision makers, and also to local people, to manage land managers, for example, farmers, for example, the National Parks and Wildlife. So it is crucial that this baseline work is done because there's so little information available in Ireland. It has to be considered that all conservation issues, really, you're just trying to, to, to get a snapshot. And there's a decision and uh, tricky decisions to be made each time. Do you want to conserve the limestone pavement and the calcareous grasslands? Or maybe hazel scrub is fine, and I think a lot of people would argue that yes, the Ireland has such low woodland cover, what is wrong with that? However, I think a balance is needed. We don't want to have hazel scrub spreading at the expense of these other valuable habitats. We do not want either the destruction of well-established hazel scrub. What we want is a balance so that hazel scrub is not expanding at the expense of other habitats. We need to understand the processes that govern our habitats. Many recent development and infrastructural decisions have been ill-informed. Expanding our knowledge of ecosystems is what the EPA's BioChange project is all about. 
Time will tell what we will see. I expect, I have 12 of these sites, I expect to see differences and maybe different um, changes at each site. Um, in a few years we will hopefully get a very good picture of the impact of grazing on biodiversity by the use of these exclosures. There is a lot slipping through our fingers and that's why work like this is very, very important. It's not okay just to have isolated national parks or nature reserves. We need a connected landscape because animals and plants don't understand the boundaries as we do. So I think, I think there's great uh, calls for hope in Ireland. Awareness is increasing, more and more people are getting involved even in a, a local and community way in biodiversity projects, but a lot is slipping through our fingers and work like this is extremely timely. As well as the burn research, the EPA-funded Biochange project covers many aspects of our changing biodiversity throughout Ireland. Further inland, in County Clare, I met up with Tom Gitling and Simon Harrison, who are researching biodiversity in the Fen wetlands. What we see around us is a very farmed landscape in Ireland, a very man-altered landscape of improved grasslands, a few hedgerows. There's not much wild land left. These areas of Fen are still more or less semi-natural and they've been here for some 10,000 years. So they represent a, a, a part of what Ireland would have looked like in much greater extent. But back a hundred years ago, any land was useful and these fens were drained and converted to agriculture. So Ireland has lost something like 80% of its fenland and the rem remnants we have left are very fragmented. They're, they're only found in bits and pieces. And the, the second um, uh, danger facing the fens is in common to all wildland is the nutrients, the fertiliser we're putting on our land in terms of phosphate and nitrate inevitably will drain into these wetlands. Simon's research includes collecting airborne insects in a tent-like structure called a malaise trap. He also dredges for waterborne insects and was on the lookout for one particularly rare species of beetle. Ah, now, let's have a look at this little fella here. Am I going to get him? I might do. Oh, let's grab him now. Oh, I think that's the one. I think that's the one. I don't know if you can see that. He's only a couple of millimetres long, but that is a little fella called Octhebius nilsoni, which is the only beetle found, water beetle found in Ireland, that is not found in the UK. It's just been discovered from these fens, so it's a classic Ar Arctic alpine refuge species. So this little fella is a very rare sight indeed. And uh, go forth and multiply, friend. Off you go. If you can look over there, all those little shallow depressions, that's all the remnants of fen cutting, fen peat cutting and they fill up with water and they're valuable habitats for dragonflies, damselflies and many other species of beetle and bug. So they're great things and uh, certainly they weren't doing anything wrong when they did this in terms of biodiversity. The damage we do every day without thinking of our surroundings may not always be apparent. We're beginning to understand that many of our actions lead to the gradual degradation of our habitats. As these research projects unfold, we learn more about how to protect these ecologically sensitive ecosystems from our changing development pressures. We need more projects like BioChange to collate and feed information back to our policymakers so we can make the connections between our actions and the impacts they inevitably have. Between March and December 2007, 36 boil water notices were issued across the country. Galway had a full-scale emergency when its primary source of drinking water was contaminated with a potentially deadly cryptosporidium. We had a terrible problem here only recently. Galway was in a, a state of crisis for quite some time. There were 90,000 people altogether, everybody in the city and quite a number of the outlying areas were also affected. So it, it really was a very big problem indeed. Galway's problem is a modern fable with lessons for us all. Rapid growth and development in the very area where drinking water is collected from resulted in sewage mixing with the city's drinking supply. What we're effectively trying to do is turn sewage into good quality drinking water because the upstream problems are where it's at. Um, you know, we have, we have sewage pouring into the water, we have uh, septic tanks, we have 
agricultural waste, we have um, forestry, runoff from forestry. I mean, th there's a lot of things going into our water source which shouldn't be going into our water source. And the biggest of these, what's the biggest issue that's affecting water? Well, the issue that I'd focus on certainly is the fact that we've got municipal sewerage going into the water. And I mean, that's absolutely unacceptable because there is money available. It's been made available to deal with the problems. And yet we have 50-year-old um, treatment plants which are not sufficient for the number of houses which are being built. And in certain cases, we have, we have towns such as Clare Galway where, um, you know, it doesn't have a, a municipal sewage treatment plant at, at all, and yet there's a massive development going on there. I spoke to Sean Dunleavy, a local hotel owner in Clare Galway, about the outbreak in his area. So when this outbreak of cryptosporidium affected this region, how did it affect you and your family? Well, immediately once um, the HSC were aware of the problem, they put a, a drinking bang on, on all the water. Because of the whole scare, um, there was a huge reduction in bookings to, for rooms in the hotel. I think if you have a lot of development in the region, and obviously we're part of that development in the region, if conditions aren't absolutely correct, then in a kind of a perfect storm situation like we had last December when floods rose all around the area, uh, I suppose it's possible that you're going to get that kind of an, an outbreak. There needs to be a whole cooperation between the authorities and the people on the ground uh, to make sure that standards are sufficient to prevent this kind of an outbreak occurring again. It really is not something that anybody in, in the world should accept, let alone in Ireland. I think we need one agency um, to oversee the whole situation. Because here in the city, we have no control over what goes into the water in the county area. It's the county council has control over that. And, you know, we get this thing of finger pointing at each other, and that's not sufficient. We need somebody to be able to say, look, you know, lads, get your act together. You have to do it. End of story. This sense of urgency is imperative if we're to tackle an issue as basic as our drinking water. The EU Water Framework Directive calls for us to improve all our water quality by 2015. But we shouldn't wait for European law to compel us to protect our health through access to clean water. I spoke to Ray Parl of the HSE. Drinking water obviously is vital for life and it's essential that water be free from microbial or chemical contamination because otherwise it can cause serious illness. What damage can it do to our health? In most healthy adults, uh, they may be sick for a few weeks, they will recover. However, in immunocompromised individuals or in the elderly or in very small children, uh, it can be fatal. And there have been fatalities recorded in, in outbreaks in other uh, parts of the world. Fortunately, not so far in Ireland. But Ireland is changing. Rapid growth can bring scarcity and poor water supply. There's no doubt that there is a significant increase now on water demand. A lot of plants were built a long, long time ago and they're under increasing pressure. Also, as a disinfection technology, chlorine has in, in the past been remarkably successful in dealing with contamination. Like E. coli. However, like, like, like E. coli, that. and it's right. very effective in combating E. coli. Unfortunately, cryptosporidium is highly resistant to chlorination and hence plants that may have successfully got rid of E. coli with their treatment systems now need to upgrade to be able to combat the cryptosporidiosis threat. Combating localised outbreaks is difficult when responsibilities lie within different authorities. This can cause confusion in grey areas, so there must be a better system. We don't have a water authority in Ireland like mm. nearly every country in Europe. Why is that and should we have one? Well, it's the whole problem with government, really, is we have lack of enforcement. We have all these, we pass this legislation and we have laws and we have groups set up to look at things. But at the end of the day, somebody has to do the work. Water really is a bit of a no-brainer. We should just be getting on and, and doing the work that we all know needs to be done. Are we managing our planning and development and our land use planning properly in this regard? No, we're not. Because in reality, we should have the water and sewage schemes in there first, before, or at least, at least in progress before the development takes place, but we're not doing that. What we're doing is we're building the development, we're planning for the, the sewerage and, and water treatment, but then we're not building it. So really, it's, it's, it's just a very, very simple issue of we have to get on with doing the work. The problem in the catchment area is certainly not solved, but at least the treatment plant in Galway City has undergone major improvements following the crisis. I talked to Kieran Hayes of Galway City Council about the ongoing problems and solutions. 
Why is the water being affected there? What is causing the problem upstream? Well, I suppose there, there are multiple issues upstream. There's issues with regard to agriculture, there are issues with regard to the proliferation of septic tanks, there are issues with regard to discharges from the wastewater treatment plants. Uh, so you have a combination of all of those. And what happened with us in, in March of 2007 was that we, we had a, a weather event where we had inclement weather for up to six weeks, followed by storms, all of which uh, contributed to the contamination of the water. And of course we could have big storms again with climate change now, couldn't we? Absolutely, and again the issue for me here, we're effectively at the end of the pipe here in Galway City, so the issue for me is to make sure we have the infrastructure, uh, which is robust infrastructure that, that's capable of dealing with the parasite. In this area here we have 10 clarifiers. This is where the chemical treatment uh, takes place. The water then uh, flows into the uh, filter beds on the far side, which is the second uh, stage treatment, and from there it goes through the, the UV, which is the, the third stage treatment. At this point in time, I think we're probably the only public supply that has that three treatment process in place. So the quality of the water that, that is being produced now in Galway City is, is among the best in the country. Galway's treatment plant may now at least be amongst the best in Ireland, but the underlying issues of contamination at source are far from being solved. With poorly planned development continuing, it seems only a matter of time before we hear the same story from many other parts of the country. The fact is that the reputation of Galway as a tourist destination was severely tarnished by uh, the whole water incident. But the reality is that um, you know th this is going to happen in other areas of the country. For more information on water quality in your area, as well as the process of testing water, check out the Environmental Protection Agency's website at epa.ie. The coastline here behind me is one of 50 places in the world where we can look back millions of years to examine the origins of our planet. I'm here in a global geopark on Waterford's Copper Coast and I'm here to look at what we are doing to preserve what is truly a unique part of our heritage. Geologist Sophie Pretasil tells me about these rock formations on the southeast coast and the exotic places they've travelled from. Hi Sophie. Hi Duncan. What a wonderful place for a geologist. It is a wonderful place. Sophie, what's unique about this geopark and what can people see? Um, what's unique about this geopark is um, 460 million years of Earth history. And really, if you can read um, the rocks, um, you can understand that um, this area was close to the South Pole uh, a very long time ago, um, under the ocean. Ireland was made of two pieces of continent, and those two pieces of continent get together. So can you show me some of this story in the rocks? Of course I yeah. can. And what have we got here? What's um, all of this? Here we have the, um, the muds that yeah. formed on the ocean floor. So originally you have to think that, you know, these muds were laid horizontally. So these were all leveled here? They were horizontal. leveled horizontally. And of course today you see that they're not in the same position. So tremendous forces pushed these rocks and tilted them and folded them. These are layers of pyrite, you know. Um, Fool's gold. Um, Fool's gold. Yes. Is it? yes yeah. It's iron sulfide, and these are actually signs of um, volcanism about to take place. Right. Um, right. So this would have been all laid level, and then, obviously, push. earth movement pushed yes. this up into earth this position. Earth movements. You have to think about tremendous forces involved um, there. I mean, it's forces you just can't imagine. If you think today, when an earthquake is taking place, and all the damages it creates. Um, you just think of earthquakes but taking place on a much longer period uh, and on a much wider scale as well. So all along this coast you're going to see different stages of different forms of evidence here of, of how Ireland really evolved on the south side, or at least the south side of Ireland. Exactly. Uh, in, in different sites along the coast you'll see uh, different type of rocks that were formed in different environments. Further down the coast in Ballyduan we move from the polar regions to the part of the island that made its way over millions of years from the desert. 
It's a stunningly beautiful area. Well, what's special about these rocks here? What's the story here? Well, the story in this place, uh, which is Bellage One, is that all these rocks are what we call all right sandstone. And all right sandstone would have typically formed in a desert. In a desert? A desert, So we've yes. come now from the, nearly from the South Pole. That's it. We're now in a desert. That's it. Where would that have been located? So, um, we were actually just south of the equator, um, in a very similar position to Africa today. So all of these rocks have moved, all of this landmass has moved up to here. That's it. Sophie, what are you doing now to protect all of this? Um, this is a preserved area. The whole stretch of coastline is um, um, all protected sites and it also has uh, international uh, recognition through the Global Geopark uh, designation under the auspices of UNESCO and with that um, the local communities are involved uh, in developing uh, geotourism, a sustainable type of tourism using geological heritage and the aim of the Geopark as well is to um, raise awareness of the fantastic beauty of the place and uh, develop education as well so people can know about this hidden gem. So when people come down here to enjoy this wonderful place how do they do it in a way that doesn't damage anything as long as they don't um, pick up specimens off the cliffs so uh, no hacking away at rock no places. no no just just refrain from doing so how far do you promote it you know you want to develop a sustainable type of tourism so you don't want mass tourism coming here encouraging people to see this natural beauty must be balanced with effective preservation measures 12 miles inland the local community of Finor have managed to do precisely this, saving a natural fen wetland from probable threat. Martin, what did the local community do here? We bought this bog in 1999 for 32 acres of a fen bog. Why did you buy it? That's quite we an extreme thing to do for a local community because we, it could be turned into farmland at best, and if not, it could have been made into a landfill right beside our, the heart of our village. When you say you're from Fenner, people say, oh, Fenner Bog is beautiful, you know. Well, it so. is beautiful. You know, it's unique. Yes. When you think, this could have ended up as a landfill or exactly. just a dumping ground. Exactly. And just look at how attractive it is. How hard is it to get local people involved in something like this? Well, I think like anything, initially it's hard to get people involved in, in something like this. You always start off in a community with a small core group of people and then when people see that it's important and see how valuable a resource we have here, that's when they get involved. Community spirit has always been very strong in Fenner, but this was the new project and so people who might not have been involved otherwise, you know, would have been interested in this particular area and so they got involved. And so also because we got recognition from outside of here, you know, we kind of stood back and thought, well, wow, we've got something very special here. Yes, it is special, isn't it? Yes. It's a fen. Yeah. Are there yes. many fens in this part of Ireland? Uh, this is the only one in the southeast, and only one of 13 bogs, uh, peatland bogs, in County Waterford left. Right. All lost through development. We're privileged to live here, but people come from far and wide to visit the bog, and it's a place where you can go out and you can be peaceful and you can be on your own, you can just enjoy nature. And I think that's very important, especially today when people rush around so much, they don't get this time out, time to themselves, and time to just stop and look around. As global energy prices rise, we're going to see a huge increase in our electricity bills over the next few years. There are simple ways to bring down the cost of your power bill at home and also reduce your carbon footprint. Make sure your household appliances are not left on standby and check the energy ratings on all your household appliances. Look for the A or A plus rating when you're buying a new one. In our next programme, we're in Mayo to see how water pollution in our rivers is monitored. We look at the resource and state of forestry in Ireland and we investigate the problems and sources of our country's litter.